So hello and welcome to the STEM Grid interview series. Uh, we are a small group of early career researchers who aim to raise awareness about STEM education. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. We are actually interested to talk about work-life balance and job opportunities. Here, the idea is to bring eminent uh, distinguished personalities of STEM and discuss their science and as well as their journey. So today we are delighted and privileged to have Padma Sri Professor Ram Krishna V. Hosur with us. And thanks a lot, Professor Hosur, for joining us today. A so pleasure. Before, before the interview, I would like to in introduce my other team members. So let's start with Harish. Hi, myself, Harish. I thank Professor Hosur for, uh, for giving his time to us today. Uh, so I am at the moment a postdoc at Ludwig Maximilian University. And uh, I mainly involved in predicting chemical or biological reactivity. Uh, heavily used quantum chemistry and in chemintromatics to do this. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. So I am Simina. Uh, I have done my PhD uh, from Leibniz Institute of Plant Biochemistry in Halle, Germany. So my area of research is mainly plant molecular biology and more specifically, I was working with long non-coding RNA and we were able to show some of the long non-coding RNA's involvement in the plant leaf development. And today we are really excited to have with us Professor Hosur. So thank you so much for giving us the time and an opportunity to interact with you. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Anand Kandas. I completed my PhD from TIFR and currently I'm a postdoc at New York University Abu Dhabi and I'm interested in the biophysics of axonal transport. Uh, thank you, Professor Hosur, for joining us. It's thank a pleasure you. to see you after a long time. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everyone. So uh, I am Himansu Singh. I am currently at West part of Germany working as a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology. And actually my area of research is in the field of nuclear magnetic resonance. It's my honor to introduce Padma Sri Professor Ram Krishna V. Hosur. So he is a well-known biophysical scientist known for his expertise in the area of NMR, method development, as well as applications looking at proteins and nucleic acids. He is currently working as Raja Raman Fellow, Center for Excellence in Basic Sciences, University of Mumbai campus, Mumbai. And formerly he, he retired from TIFR Mumbai uh, from the Department of Chemical Sciences as a senior professor. So my first question is about your role in um, uh, building or establishing Center for Excellence in Basic Sciences. So what, what we see uh, you have been at TIFR Mumbai and during that time you were very much inclined uh, in the establishment of CEBS. So uh, how did that journey start? Okay. Uh, thank you, Himanshu, for your kind introduction and, uh, and asking me to be part of your uh, uh, efforts for, uh, in regard to the STEM. And it is certainly a pleasure for me to be involving myself with you people. And it has always been my desire to uh, promote, promote the scientific activities, inspire the young minds so as they can take up scientific careers and contribute to the development of the society uh, in general. So the, my commitment to Center for Excellence in Basic Sciences started in the same way. So when I was uh, at TIFR, this Center for Excellence of in uh, Excellence in Basic Sciences was started as a co collaboration between the University of Mumbai and the Department of Atomic Energy to promote basic sciences. Typically, it was observed at that time that the basic sciences are getting neglected and people had the tendency to either opt for engineering or medicine and things like that, applied sciences. However, the importance of the basic sciences is getting lost. Nevertheless, a person cannot be a good engineer or a good medical person unless his basics are very clear, unless the basic science uh, knowledge is, is very good. Therefore, this has to be supported and promoted at any cost. 
and it was also recognized by the government of india and therefore they started bringing up this uh, icers you know they established there are five icers at that time indian institute of science education and research they established at prominent places like kolkata pune chandigarh okay and a uh, few more they came up at that time there was one in bhopal so and now of course they have established more than more than there are about eight or nine today icers however the difficulty what we had was that uh, the thought which came to head uh, our mind and came to the mind of several people including professor chitre who was then at the mumbai university uh, that these icers of course it is a very good idea these are stand alone institutions but then it cannot reach the entire student community in the country a vast student community in the country it costs a lot to uh, uh, create an institution like an icer it's like i mean each one of them was about 1000 crores and they would develop over a period of 5 years train about 2000 students and things like that and to build the entire infrastructure however 70 to 80% of the students in india come from the universities a lot of investment has been made in the universities infrastructure has been built a large number of students come from the universities i think we should tap this resource unless we try to lift the universities up the entire education system is not going to improve you may produce a few excellent uh, uh, pockets here and there but the overall education in the country cannot in- in- improve therefore it was very necessary to build a kind of a system bring in a certain kind of a model whereby the university system gets promoted enhanced and the quality of education in the university gets enhanced and quality people will get recruited at the universities so that is there was an important idea and therefore how to do it was a big question and therefore this was an idea which was uh, an experiment started by mumbai university and department of atomic energy why not start an institution of excellence in the campus of a university it will however be completely autonomous like the icers university will give land to the center for establishing its laboratories and offices university will provide the degrees but complete education training teaching etc will be done by the in house faculty or the visiting faculty to the center for excellence in basic sciences they will invite people from outside they will have a core number of faculty and they will invite people from other institutions around and for the teaching purposes and establish infrastructure such that it is of very high quality so that was the driving force for creating the center for excellence in basic science this way you can actually create a large number of these in the university systems because a lot of investment has been made in the universities okay you don't have to rebuild all of those things but you only want to create an academic environment academic atmosphere which is of high quality so that by just being there the university will get actually elevated if you look for example if we go to a particular institution there is certainly a nobel laureate let us say assuming there is a nobel laureate right no matter how many other people are there the institution becomes known because of those two people the mm-hmm. entire institution gets a name entire place gets a name some 30 40 people all of them will become very important because these people are there Yeah. so therefore the um, the the ambience changes completely and the outlook changes completely and therefore they will all get support they will get various kinds of facilities so that they can all do very well so that was the idea with which we this we started that you create a center for excellence and, and this will then radiate excellence so to say it will radiate excellence to the departments and the universities departments so that they all will excel and they will excel in getting quality people into their own core faculty and the students of course will be benefited by that that is how this was started and this this impressed me very much and therefore i decided okay i will go all the way out for that of course it is not that it is not with the tr- troubles difficulties yeah. because whenever you go and occupy somebody's place there will always be kind of uh, uh, <laughs> hurt i mean somebody will get hurt okay that maybe you are overriding us and you are taking priority over us and things like that this sort of feelings will be there this technical uh, ego problems will be there and then of course there are also administrative problems will be there you want to get an autonomy while well, nobody else has an autonomy and somebody will object to that why should that be why should that be a different thing from the department of the university well you see you don't go there to create another department of the university you are going there to elevate the entire university system 
by creating a center for excellence. As I said, just like hiring a few Nobel laureates in a particular place elevates the entire institution. So that is how this kind of a thing has to be looked at. And at the same time, we'll come out with a very little space. The university doesn't have to do much for that. They simply have to give a little bit of space and recognize and give them complete freedom. Okay, the money will be arranged by somebody else. The university yeah. is not going to give you any money. Right. Here, the Department of Atomic Energy was giving you the full support, financial support. Therefore, there is no kind of a um, uh, load on the university with regard to the money. Mm -hmm. It will only benefit. Therefore, there is a win-win situation for that. And the students who will qualify from this will actually be the ambassadors to go when they go elsewhere to develop this culture, to spread this culture. So that is how this was started. And of course, you have to recruit quality people, take quality students. So there was a kind of a nest examination, uh, which, is, uh, which is conducted across the country. And a large number of students will appear for this. And today, if you see, in the first year, actually, there were something like about 10,000 students who applied, or even not even 10,000, maybe 3,000, 4,000 students who applied. And today, one lakh students apply. Uh -huh. One lakh students apply yeah. for this, and you select only about 100 students. So actually, the selection criteria for the students is much tougher than it is for the JE. Mm -hmm. So the basic sciences, actually, therefore, this selection is very, very stringent. But therefore, quality students are coming in. Now you have to get quality people also for teaching. Therefore, a network was established with regard with respect to DIFR, BARC, you know, the departments, other institutions. Like we also got people from Pune, Ayuka, okay, and then IIT Bombay. So you select people from there. They will come and teach here. Of course, you make them, you give them honorarium and make the payments for the teaching they do. And this will cost you much less than actually hiring a larger number of faculty inside. So they will benefit, the, those people will benefit by getting additional uh, thing for the uh, lectures they give. But the academic benefit the institution will give, will get is quite enormous. So they will teach and they will come and teach high quality teaching. And therefore the, you see the students will be benefited immensely by this kind of a teaching. They don't have to go anywhere. And it is like a gurukul. All the students will live there. Yeah. They come from various parts of the country and they live there. And they can interact with the faculty anytime, all through. So it's like a gurukul as they live there and then work with the faculty, the teachers and things like that. And the second important point was to invite people from outside, eminent people from outside, to come and give lectures. We actually got several Nobel laureates also to come and give lectures. And the university was feeling very proud about it. It says, because of this, we are getting so many Nobel laureates here. Yeah. And they had, uh, arranged public lectures, and people spent here this time there to, for interacting with those people, derive inspiration from those people. And that is the way, that is the model to progress. So bring in a kind of a, an academic ambience of excellence in, this, in the central, in the center, so that the university will feel very, very, very elevated by this process. The university was very happy with that. And this was a model which we set up. And of course, it took time for us. It took time because there were also administrative problems because the, the university is the state government and the DAE is the central government. How to get the money transferred from the central government to the state government. These problems were there, these issues were there. One has to make a special case for this. And then you have to register this as a, initially it was started as an experiment, as I told you. So it was in the project mode. It was five years project mode. At the end of the five years, it has to become a society and institution by itself. And therefore, there are difficulties in this process. In this particular one has to take steps to get over this. So one has to go to the central government, the union cabinet. One had to go to the union cabinet, write a proposal, go to the union cabinet, get the clearance from them that this should be an autonomous society. This is intended for, they intended for enhancing the quality of the education in the country as a whole, as a role model for other universities to follow, this comes out with them at a much lesser cost compared to what it is for ICER establishment. And this was received very well by the, by the government. And they cleared it. They said, okay, this will be autonomous, fully autonomous, academically, financially, administratively autonomous. And they gave the permission to appoint also people, recruit also people. And we have recruited uh, faculty soon after that. There are, of course, right. more faculties will get recruited in due course, but this process will happen. 
Yes. It has to happen slowly because the university has to give a little bit more land so that you can build more structures. We have not built structures. We have built buildings for this, which is not too much space. It is just about three acres of land. Mm -hmm. In just about three acres of land, this whole thing is built. All the infrastructure of the university is already available to you. All the halls and lecture halls, the auditoriums, the roads, parks, everything is available, library, everything is available to you. Although you created your own library for this, your classrooms and things like that you have to create so that they, they don't clash with the others. Uh, then the timetables you have to try and match with those of the universities. So the university department students can also come and attend this and do, uh, have a partnership with the university faculty for writing grant proposals. For example, I'm also an honorary professor in the Department of Biophysics, for instance. Hmm. So you establish kind of such kind of partnerships, okay? And yeah. uh, that way, that way the university will benefit. You write grant proposals, joint grant proposals, with the university department. So therefore automatically the benefit will go there. So now we have, you also try and attract faculty to the university departments and establish collaborations with them so that the research will flourish as well. And the students will, students from the you know, department of the university can do projects in your place so that they will benefit. So this is the way it was going on. And now you see, I have also, I one of my postdocs is actually in the department of, and Pushpa, you know Pushpa, of course, she is an inspired faculty. I advise her, you come and join the Department of Biophysics and I will interact with you. So we are interact there, so together. So you can write the research papers together and that way she gets an academic satisfaction and the university benefits by having such quality people in there. And she's right. doing extremely well in teaching. So this is how the motivation and the process went on. Of course, it went through, through a lot of hard work to build the buildings. Actually, we started with the prefabs. No. Prefabricated structures, because no. what is what is important to realize is the institution is made by the people, not by the buildings. Buildings will come. See, so as TIFR is also concerned. You see, the TIFR started in 1945. Yeah. The main building of TIFR came in 1964, 20 years later. Until then, it was all in hutments. Yeah. All the great research was done in the hutments. So in that way, the, we built the prefabs, academic activity went on. It turned without any hindrance. At the same time, the building construction also started along with that. So now the buildings are also there, the hutments are also there. So you are using both of them. So you had to develop in that manner. So that is how it is in our success story. It is uh, it has been replicated in one of the other universities like Raipur. Raipur has replicated this model, and the Kerala also came to us to re replicate this model. And therefore, mm -hmm. this world is spreading. So the mm -hmm. culture is spreading. And we feel satisfied, we feel happy that, okay, some way we can do to the development of education in the country. Wow. It has to take to further. Yeah. Very nice. Thanks for bringing this uh, 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 in light, actually. So uh, you, you already talked about the vision of CBS establishment, how it is different from universities, IITs, even ICERs. Yeah, and yeah. so uh, is there any other DA plans to build a center for excellence in basic sciences uh, across the country? Well, DAE across the country doesn't have to be always DAE. See, in okay. Mumbai, mm -hmm. so that at that time, Kakodkar was the chairman AAC. At that time, they had the Department of Security, Department of Atomic Energy, and uh, the vice chancellor, they had a conversation, they dealt with it. Now, hmm. when it went to Raipur, then somebody in Raipur started, the vice chancellor of uh, Raipur University decided to do it. He went to the state government there. It doesn't matter who is a funding agency. Right. In this case, the DE was a funding agency, okay. but it can be somebody else also. It can be DST, it can be DBT, it can be CSIR. Anybody can be the funding agency. Right. But the vision has to be the same. Vision has to be of that type. Because the amount of money that you require is much less. Yes, suppose sir. CSIR wants to create another CSIR laboratory, its cost is going to be very high. Yes. And same with the DST or the DBT. Instead, right. if they fund such a kind of a center, the cost will be much less, but they will achieve much more for the same amount of money. So right. anybody can be the funding agency. In fact, this was made clear in our original proposal also. Anybody can be the funding agency and uh, that will excel. Yeah, sure, sure it will. So we need such new institution to exchange scientific knowledge between institute and universities, as you already pointed out, yeah. and place new faculties and uh, mm -hmm. giving some place for 
um, this big number of students. Yeah. So uh, it, thanks a lot uh, for this uh, uh, very elaborate answers. Actually, now um, uh, yeah, I I would like to talk about some uh, questions on work-life balance. So you have been very active uh, teacher. What I have closely observed in TIFR, a mentor and a researcher in TIFR, and have yeah, a significant yeah. role in establishing Center for Excellence in Basic Sciences. So my question is, how did you achieve an excellent work-life balance in your career? Yeah, I mean, so this is all the, this is all a commitment, Himashu. Yeah, right. So you have a commitment to uh, teaching and learning. Right. I always believed that teaching is a process of learning as well. So therefore, because when you teach the students, they don't come with a baggage. Okay, and therefore there is a very open discussion and you may get sometimes questions which you may not have thought about. You may get new ideas in the process. And therefore, I always felt teaching has to go along. Teaching is a process of learning. So therefore, when you are doing research, teaching is always useful because you generate new ideas. Yeah. You generate new ideas in the process of teaching because when you want to teach, you really want to see that the other person understands it. So when the other person has to understand, you have to put it in a way, taking into account the background of the people who are listening to you. So you have to place it in that level or to place it, explain it in that manner so that that improves the clarity of your own thinking. Yeah. And when that happens, your basics will get even enhanced and that will allow you to think of new research ideas. Right. Okay. So therefore, I always felt the teaching and research have to go hand in hand. They cannot be separated. These are the two faces of the same coin. So that, that was my uh, testing at TIFR also. I offered courses in NMR, I offered courses in mathematics, courses in biophysics, in order to learn myself, yeah. learn myself how to improve, how to improve mm. this science and how I can contribute better to this. In fact, that has certainly helped me. And in, I, I also got this from Richard Ernst. Mm. Richard Ernst was already such an established, of course, great scientist. At that time, of course, when, when I was there in 81 to 83, he was not an Nobel laureate yet. He was already an accomplished researcher, but he was teaching regularly. Right. He was teaching regularly and I attended his courses. And he was an excellent teacher, attended his courses. He took so much pains to prepare his transparencies, explain it in a way that everybody understands it very well. And those who want to do more mathematics, they will go to him and learn more mathematics with that. And therefore that actually had triggered in me a uh, thought that, okay, one must do things like that. So I even, I preserve my lecture notes of that time, even today, I still have those. In okay. fact, that was the starting point for me for teaching at TIFR. I offered courses in NMR. And of course it got completely getting um, uh, improved year by year. Now, now that is now coming out in the form of a book. Just now this book is completed. Wow. And it is, uh, Springer is Springer is publishing that now. Wow. Very nice. So I, I titled as a graduate course in NMR spectroscopy. So this will be something which should be useful for all mm -hmm. those who want to into NMR spectroscopy, whether it took for chemistry or for structural biology or whatever. This mm -hmm. is based on the course which I was teaching at TIFR and also at CBS and both right. the places. This is So this is coming up. So therefore, I always try to balance the teaching and the research activities and take, and you have to have commitment. Of course, it requires a lot of work for doing so, think of new ideas. When it has to, re to do research, you always have to think of new ideas. The right. new ideas will generate a kind of a pleasure that uh, you cannot get it from anywhere else. You know, that the pleasure from original research is unmatched. Okay, the money cannot give you that kind of a pleasure. It is the accomplishment of an achievement of, uh, of research gives you a lot more pleasure than anything else. And it is entirely yours. Nobody can take it away from you. So therefore, high quality research is an important factor and this will be helped by, uh, by the teaching because you also generate quality students by this and the students mm -hmm. will also contribute to the research. So it is a feedback mechanism there. You teach to the students, you bring them up and they will contribute to the research. And therefore it is a win-win situation for both. And therefore you see all the students who took this course they are doing extraordinarily well. They are doing well in their own research, and therefore that is an important uh, feedback mechanism for for me to see if they all get established very well. It gives us more pleasure. 
so mm. this is uh, and that is how we I, I took research and teaching hand in hand in TIFR and this was very helpful for me great professor Vasuri. it's really amazing uh, to see that, that that progress actually and uh, when you talk about uh, nmr uh, uh, yeah, yeah. topic and your recent book that is coming uh, soon so yeah, yeah. would you like to point out some new, new and exciting areas of potential applications in nmr spectroscopy this is a, you see i think it will be it will be very dangerous to make any predictions in this regard you know <laughs> 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 Several years ago, in, the, uh -huh. in 19, I tell you, uh, it's a little bit of the history there. In the 1960s, mm. people thought that NMR is dead. Yeah. There is no more, no more uh, fun in doing NMR. Right. Okay. It was because of sensitivity, right? Ah, because of sensitivity. Yeah. And, this, okay, and then, of course, you require tons of material and uh, the fields are so limited. Stability of the spectrometers is so low. And yeah. it's gone case with NMR, it's not going to be useful. But then yeah. you see what has happened. Mm. And you have the FTNMR came up in 1966. It revolutionized the sensitivity issue. Right. Then two-dimensional NMR came up. And again, once again, people thought after some time that, well, everything has, has been already been done in 2D NMR. Nothing more needs to be done. You need to mm. consider only applications. All right. But then again, you see 3D NMR came, heteronuclear NMR came and various kinds of additional things have come up to in, and then application in solid state came up, solid state mm -hmm. NMR came up, then the DNP came up, hyperpolarization came up yeah. and you see so many things develop. So therefore it is very dangerous to make predictions about these kind of things. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so you let the people with creativity create. Okay, yeah. so they will have their ideas. You have to accept, you have to have an open mind and say, okay, now nothing is going to be at the end point, it will That's grow, right. it will grow. And the challenges are there. You need to address quality issues, quality problems and develop accordingly. And okay. therefore, and then the metabolomics became an important topic. Metabolomics is so uh, issue. And you have to keep changing the uh, post. So uh, as newer and newer things come, you have to keep updated yourself with regard to the developments and with yeah. regard to the applications. Think of new applications. Now, of late, I have started working in an area called herbalomics. Mm. So this is, uh, uh, as somebody mentioned, Ayurveda. In fact, yeah. I got interested in this Ayurveda because there are lots of things which have been done in Ayurveda, which we don't understand it so well. Mm. Now we have the tools which are there, and why not we use these tools and uh, try and understand the Ayurvedic principles. So Ayurveda deals with lots kinds of small molecules and plant products, and they interact with various kinds of metabolic pathways in your cells, in the human beings. And therefore, in this process, they actually reduce the side effects and have a benefit of improving the health conditions overall. It improves right. the immunity of your system. This is not symptom-based symptom treatment. It actually improves the quality of your health. That is immune... Uh, and, and many times there are coupled pathways which you don't know. Therefore, a particular allopathic drug which you may give may improve a particular, uh, remove certain kinds of symptoms, but it may do something else somewhere. You do not know that. We don't attend to it. Hmm. Whereas there's multiple products which are present in this. They all work simultaneously at different levels. And that is how they can actually co contribute to different uh, benefits. We demonstrated this using Trifala, for example. Hmm. Trifala is one. Uh, Ayurvedic product, which yeah. is used for many, many different things. And yeah. we demonstrated that this actually is able to inhibit fibrillation of the alpha cellulose, mm. which is responsible for Parkinson's disease. Correct. Yeah. At the same time, the same trifla is able to abrogate cancer cell proliferation. Mm. The so-called two different diseases, widely apart, nobody would have thought there is a relationship between these two. Hmm. But it is not that there is a relationship between these two. We don't know. But still, the same drug, same trifla is able to handle both. So hmm. therefore, there is no question of having a side effect of something. Okay, some particular drug goes and promotes. It becomes uh, um, uh, oncogenic. Hmm. Question here. Whereas yeah. We always think that many drugs which are given for something, they may be oncogenic. It may produce cancer. So here, such kind of a thing will not happen. You have right. to try and understand the mechanisms of these ones. Now hmm. you have modern tools. You have the technology developed. NMR is developed very well. You have other techniques which are available. Use this combination and study the system. So therefore, what you will contribute here is going to be unique. Yeah. 
and Ayurveda has a strength in India. This right. is something which has been used for thousands of years mm -hmm. and people do not know yet as to how they actually work. That's true. Why they just give you certain quantities of powder or oh, the pinch of the heart and give you a powder. De diya. Okay. <laughs> So, how much quantity it is, what does it contain, how it's prepared, they do not know that. Yeah. But it comes by parampara, so-called parampara. This is they gave, uh, they have learned it from their parents and the parents and parents, if they continue that, it works. But how mm. it works to be acceptable in the scientific community, to make it more public, and you have to provide all of these intricate details. If you provide that, then becomes a kind of a natural science, scientific development, and it will be accepted by the entire academic community and the medical community as a whole. Hmm. If we don't do that now, I will yeah. tell you that the West will do it and yeah. you will start going after them. That's true. So it is right yeah. now an appropriate time for us to do it hmm. and we have the advantage. So, and therefore we took up this. Therefore, I started this area called Herbalomics in CBS hmm. and um, a lot of people are working on this. Uh, Sinjan is working on it. Sinjan, I don't know if you know Sinjan. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. uh, so this is, and Manu Lopez is working on it. He is working with the cancer. Sinjan mm. is working with uh, uh, alpha synuclein and Ashutosh is working with uh, diabetes and all of these people are used, trying to use some of these herbal products. Mm. See how it can be used. Very nice. Uh, so your love and interest in Ayurveda is really amazing and definitely we should work in, in this direction. So uh, yeah, yeah. Professor Hosur, what has not been explored still in understanding the power of Ayurveda scientifically? Yes, no, no, there are a lot of questions, a lot of unanswered yeah. questions, a lot mm -hmm. of unanswered questions with regard to this. You must be able to, uh, because there are a lot of products, a lot of products which are uh, generated. We need to understand the relationship between uh, the functioning of the Ayurvedic drugs mm -hmm. and the way they, the way they uh, impact your metabolic system. You see, mm -hmm. the language of the Ayurveda is different from the language of the allopathy today. Okay. Mm -hmm. The language of Ayurveda is, they will say, okay, there are three entities called Vata, Pitta, Kapha. Okay, it is a balancing yeah. of all of these things in the human body, which mm. is responsible for uh, your health. Any imbalance causes diseases. Okay, right. this is fine. And in Balopati, what we do, when a disease comes, you target a particular kind of a molecule. What is the disturbance there? How it happens? What is the relationship between those two? Now, you have to talk, you have to make that connection. What is the connection between these um, uh, molecular properties as Vata, Pitta, Kapha? Is it related in some manner to its structure, to, to the, its properties like Rasa? Rasa is another important quantity which, element which is used in, in Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. And Rasa is supposed to um, convey the structural features as well. It is the structure which actually gives a different kind of a taste. Rasa means taste. Yeah. So, okay, pungent taste or sweet taste or something, it is intimately connected with the structure. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, you try and connect that with the structure and the structure goes connected to the protein structure or the genomic structure and things like that. You establish that connection. How does it regulate the gene expression if a particular kind of a combination you take? Is there a synergy between different kinds of molecules? The synergy is responsible for avoiding the side effects. You can demonstrate, if you talk in this language, the allopathic people will understand that. Mm. Okay, so therefore you have to develop that kind of a communication, communication mm. between these two. And mm. this has to be done very carefully, taking all the uh, uh, modern tools which are available to you. Right. Methods, NMR methods, crystallographic methods, electron microscopy, Mass whatever, all the techniques yeah. one should use, you should mm. use and understand that. Demonstrate mm. the functioning of the Ayurvedic products, the synergy between the different components of that one, mm. and the synergy will tell you how the functioning happens inside that. So, mm. and that is that is an unanswered question. See, right. uh, today in allopathy, you also talk about personalized medicine. Mm. Okay, one dress doesn't fit all. Yeah. Okay, but yeah. earlier people used to think, okay, one drug fits all. Yeah. But that that doesn't uh, is not applicable anymore. People mm. have started thinking of personalized medicine, but this mm. was already there in Ayurveda. Mm. Ayurveda already said every individual is an individual, is specific. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to deal with that individual's Vata Pitta Kapha balance and mm. Vata Pitta Kapha gets translated into the Rasas and mm. the Rasas are related to the molecular structures and therefore you establish a correlation between these. And when you do that, then you have a possibility of uh, um, bringing out what all Ayurvedic people did. 
see in the charwa uh, uh, what is it sanhita charu sanhita charu sanhita shushrush shushrush sanhita is one and charwa charvaka or charu sanhita i think i am this name confused this is ayurveda that person who wrote this book on ayurveda okay uh, shushrush was the, these were all rishis actually this is thousands of years ago yeah the rishis the shushrusha carried out the uh, surgeries mm. 500 different types of surgeries he has described and all yeah. of these are in sanskrit mm. and even today the plastic surgery of the nose which is being carried out in the modern medicine is mm. similar to what was prescribed there mm. okay this but people did not understand it so mm. now you try and read that and bring it down into us so you actually you can do better contribution to the modern science even modern right. medicine you can contribute to modern medicine you can contribute to systems medicine you can contribute to systems biology because they all dealt with in uh, in uh, um, ho- um, a holistic approach mm-hmm. the holistic approach interaction between the different components that is what was right. important for them okay. yeah uh, yeah so you were trying to address this charak sam- sanhita charak sanhita charak sanhita yeah right yeah so it's really uh, definitely uh, Uh, we should look into this so uh, what is lacking professor husur in this direction uh, in indian science uh, is it, this is the, typically what is happening in indian science is mm. unfortunately we are still followers many if you look at the the way things are going unless you get a, a pat on the back from the west people don't think it is good mm. okay so yeah. that tendency that kind of a mindset is still there among many people so unless you try to unless you somebody say you appreciates your work somebody from the west appreciates your work our own people will not appreciate this is our problem okay in order that you recognize our people you must be able to appreciate the work which they have done within this not necessarily have to go to for an appreciation from those who do not understand this Mm. ayurveda is still not understood by of course slowly they are trying to understand it okay right. slowly they are trying to understand it is becoming yeah. it is becoming popular that is why i have warned many of these young people if yeah. you don't do it today somebody in the west will do it and then you go after them again right. so you will continue to remain followers you will never become yeah. leaders so if right. you want to be leaders you have to start working on areas which others have not explored yeah okay and initially you will face difficulties of course Hmm. you will face difficulties in acceptance whenever something is new created there will be always hmm. opposition to accept it so hmm. you will face difficulties in the beginning but you have to pursue you have to pursue that matter and then only it will get recognized hmm. i just i give i give examples of this for example when fourier transform nmr was discovered by richard hmm. evans hmm. his paper was rejected three times by journal of chemical physics <laughs> because it did yeah. not correspond to the conventional uh, spectroscopy and nobody understood that they just rejected it Yeah. so same thing happens if you take a particular kind of a ayurvedic product and you do a certain holistic research send mm. it to nature they will reject it straight away right. and therefore if they reject it then you say okay this is no good research and don't do it mm. and then you start following what others are doing over there and then you become followers and they will All be right. very happy with that yeah so therefore you need to be you need to be very courageous mm. you need to be courageous and take measures so that you continue to contribute from the from the indians and this is also less expensive for that matter mm. this research is also less expensive you can do yeah. that and there are many things you can do whatever you do in this is new mm. whatever you do in this not apart from the holistic research but the understanding that you provide in terms of the modern science in terms of the modern tools that is totally new that will be new so everything will be new so that's why there is a golden mine gold mine there so you dig into that you will get a lot of gold that's true yeah. yeah yeah so we will generate enormous opportunities and the west will follow that then that's true. earlier earlier western people used to come to india to learn to right. gather gain knowledge correct see these things like nalanda and takshashila these you know see the center for excellence people used to come from all over the world to learn there that's true and they systematically destroyed this in order to establish their own culture yeah they systematically destroyed this. the gurukuls were destroyed india had some 7000 700000 gurukuls at that time they destroyed them slowly because hmm. gurukuls were the best centers of excellence they said gurukuls are illegal and therefore they destroyed all of them and imposed hmm. their own rules of uh, 
this one and slowly slowly we have become followers right. if you want to become leaders you have to take up things which are not done by others have courage mm. in uh, developing them and mm. even if you publish in a normal journal indian journal or any other small journal it is still okay yeah it's still okay. something new will always go like that only that's true which was the, the noe for example when vitrish published it it mm. was not published in any great journal yeah they published in bbrc yeah okay and that won the nobel prize eventually that's true yeah right so therefore i think it is whenever there is something new there will be always be initial hesitation for the established people to right. accept them no yeah. but you have to challenge it you have to continue you have to challenge it and then go ahead right. then only will it will reach uh, great heights right uh, at last actually in this direction what is your advice to young researchers to understand ayurveda targeting deadly diseases mainly cancers neurological disorders mm-hmm. as well as lifestyle diseases uh, i would like to just point out this cardiovascular problems mm. that is very prominent these days yes yes no no sure actually there are an enormous enormous number of diseases uh, which require uh, treatment and this have been used uh, in the by the ayurvedic drugs people have used them now you have to develop and develop an understanding of all of those ones then mm. you will contribute to the society you will contribute to the society how to deal with this and systematize the process mm. systematize the process and it will benefit the uh, healthcare systems yeah. and you provide new uh, generations in the yeah. in the drugs the biosimilars is another area biosimilars is something which is now coming up as an important area Mm. but these were some biomolecules which are with at the starting uh, molecules and now try to look for which are similar mm. now the starting molecules themselves can be from the ayurveda then once you do it then of course it generates a new whole set of biosimilars mm. so therefore it is, it is important to identify the new components new components which are present in this ayurveda how do they work how are how is the synergy coming in there what is the synergy between the different components how do they affect the different metabolic pathways therefore you need to combine that with systems biology as well when you give a particular kind of a uh, ayurvedic product you try and see which portion of the uh, metabolic pathways are enhanced or which are suppressed so mm. this you will do by systems biology okay mm. so there may be several proteins expressed at the same time and mm. some may be regulated some may be deregulated so all of these things can happen so if you understand that then of course you can see overall holistic picture at the mechanistic level and which molecules are interacting with that also you will come to know by the modern scientific tools right yeah okay that's great actually uh, so professor husur just uh, one more point in this direction where, where yeah, do yeah. you see the commercialization of ayurveda no so commercialization is it will automatically come it will automatically come once you demonstrate this benefits hmm. see when you demonstrate the benefits of particular kinds of, and systematically you give it already there are many drugs which are marketed hmm. this himalaya for example himalaya or patanjali or several other companies dabur all of these people are selling drugs in a particular way hmm. okay hmm. this is on the basis of the experience on the basis of the experience of the performance with regard to the treatments the commercialization is already happening that mm-hmm. many of these drugs are already manufactured by different kinds of uh, it will increase further once you provide a mechanism once you yeah. provide a mechanism for that then you can improvise on their compositions okay the commercialization then will go on it will develop it will come yeah. yeah it will naturally come right yeah thanks a lot and it is really emerging and uh, we should look much more into this area so professor husur where we will see you in the next 5 years where you will see me yeah <laughs> oh i don't know <laughs> your, your your inclination or research interest in which direction see, see, look himashu <laughs> i mean let me let me a little philosophical here i yeah. don't know what's going to happen to me next moment <laughs> that's true that's true 5 years is too long a period <laughs> yeah yeah i'm but looking at the sunny side becoming yes. positive so, so yeah therefore i mean my target will be to continue to yeah. uh, promote this interaction between i recently wrote an editorial mm-hmm. a guest editorial mm-hmm. uh, called herbalomics mm-hmm. a key to integrative medicine mm-hmm. okay 
herbalomics is a key to integrative medicine what does that mean mm. herbalomics deals with both plant genomics and mm. human genomics i mean in the human side you have this genomics uh, transcriptomics proteomics metabolomics all of these are there a similar thing exists for the plants as well right. now you have marriage between these two omics from the plant side and then from the human side and that is herbalomics right okay so you can do this this is the editorial i wrote recently and uh, and this is the way to go i believe that whatever you achieve in this is going to be extraordinary wow. my efforts will continue in that manner i am trying to induce young people into it more and more so they can generate new ideas and generate a new research quality research in this process and contribute to the healthcare system globally and slow as you, as you develop this more and more it will get accepted by see look for example curcumin what happened with curcumin mm. curcumin was being used in india for ages mm. for dealing with so many different kinds of things but nobody cared our yeah. people only themselves did not care mm. but in the west america took it and they found the benefits of that they wanted to take a patent on that one and mm. then you wake up mm. then you wake up and start fighting and go to the god and fortunately you won the case mm. sussex can happen so why do you allow for that you do it yourself to begin with do you explore all these various kinds of products which are there identify the various components in there and what do they do to the different kinds of disease system what is the relation between a particular structure and its rasa or its relation to the vata or the pitta or the kapha how does it influence your health system you demonstrate that so you need to talk to ayurvedic doctors as well in this process okay. you need to have in your stream basic physicist basic chemist basic biologist and ayurvedic practitioners so mm-hmm. all of these people are required you have to have a collaborative effort in this so that you gain to know you gain from them as to how to deal with a particular kind of a formulation mm-hmm. and recently i just saw a book which is called trifala the mm-hmm. book entire called about some few hundred pages uh, not more than that actually several hundred pages book which is written by is is like a compendium so many people have written about it and it traces back all the way from ayurveda to what is thing it is a part of 1500 ayurvedic formulations hmm. trifala is a part of 1500 ayurvedic formulations hmm. and all these obviously ayurvedic formulations are different diseases different ailments now how does this do yeah. so you demonstrate this i'm sure you will get half a dozen nobel prizes <laughs> wow this is very exciting professor hosur thanks for inspiring motivating us and uh, sharing your thoughts on different topics actually a last question i would like to ask uh, with respect to psd life in india uh, yeah, prevailing yeah, yeah. covid 19 situation so recently yes. actually yesterday i uh, read one article uh, students uh, suicide at one of the premium institution Uh, belonging yeah. to chemistry department i would like yeah. i don't want to take the name so yeah. uh, there there are lots of pressure to students they are lonely they are completely lost very isolated somehow mm. plans are not working they are not highly motivated what they are doing mm. so or sexually harassed so what are your suggestions to tackle such increasing problems prevailing covid 19 situations yeah no himanshu this is not only do with the covid 19 actually this problems uh, existed even before that as well mm. you see the by and large an academic career is a challenging career That's the true. most of the time there are failures then there are successes mm. 70 to 80% of the time there are failures with regard to the research and you will get some 10 20% times you get success but that success is unparalleled mm. okay so therefore it requires a certain degree of patience and pursue but at the same time it also requires the policy makers also to think no, do not make blanket rules so one has to have a kind of a flexibility there has to be a certain kind of a flexibility to understand the problems of a particular individuals mm-hmm. and particular problems the research problems which are there and uh, and then accordingly you promote them accordingly you promote their research promote their activities scholars should continue don't make a blanket five and five year rule and this actually puts a lot of pressure on the students and i uh, i certainly see this happening it puts a lot of pressure and if they don't achieve something within 3 4 years they start panicking 
okay now what will happen to me next what will happen to me next and things like that i actually even today i am experiencing this i go to iits there are many students there and four years ho gaya abhi koi paper nahi aaya to so what will happen to me i don't get a post doctoral position afterwards things right. like that yeah so uh, it is true it is a it is a problem but one has to, what what one needs to do here what i try to do is try to boost their morale mm-hmm. try to boost their morale and look here difficulties arise in every aspect of your life there are you cannot predict what's going to happen to you mm-hmm. any time what success will come you do your efforts the result is not completely in your hands so but you have to be patient and the research will come it will yield result continuous when, when you pursue it will it will research will come i can help you wherever it is possible you don't wait until that okay i will only publish a paper in nature and nothing else mm. don't do think don't think like that mm. if you think like that then of course you are likely to be more frustrated than mm. than success so you need to put forward the results put up your results for publication as and when they come Mm-hmm. and sometimes you get extraordinary results fine very good but sometimes actually there may be results which are of importance nonetheless you mm-hmm. should try and put it up further it will boost your confidence boost yeah. your confidence that you have achieved something so that you can do more you yeah. can do more so this is the way one can go and uh, sometimes it takes uh, there is no one particular uh, rule i can give you for this this is individual dependent specific this dependence and uh, you have to deal with them case by case case right. by case and uh, depending upon the situation one has to consider extending their scholarships extending giving them more facilities things like that all this has to be done i i try to preach this uh, at wherever possible and somewhere it has worked somewhere it has not worked so that is right. uh, nonetheless the students should not should not lose their heart because research yeah. is a thing like that research when you want to do something unusual of course you will face problems right because you know if you knew everything then there is no fun in doing it mm-hmm. okay if everything was already known and you simply have to do is like a template eh, fill up the table mm-hmm. then there is no fun in doing that so you mm-hmm. don't enjoy that also so yeah. you need to have a challenges on one hand and also be patient you need to be patient for that also so only together when you do it pursue it of course you will get success and in the end of course you will see i give examples of my own students several students which uh, um uh, i give example of sanjay panchal hmm. uh, sanjay hmm. panchal was one of those guys who uh, did not have a paper for four years right and uh, he got so frustrated because initially he was working with some proteins and the protein used to get precipitated either it will not express or when it express it gets precipitated it will ex- and then it was not getting good nma spectra hmm. then i actually asked said okay by you shift to dna now work on dna Mm. he started working with the we synthesized the dna prepared the dna but mm. it so happened that the nmr tube broke inside the magnet so all the <laughs> dna sample is lost so no what do you do go and yeah. be, again, become angry with him that you are not careful and things like that no yeah. i never did that right i said so. okay this is this is an accident these things do happen mm. let us do something different so i said okay let us work on pulse sequence development i will sit with you together work on the pulse sequence development Right. and we developed this hn and hnc and pulse sequences yeah yeah that and is the most know, most cited work uh, most one cited, of most cited yeah. Yeah. and that became an extraordinary thing for him that's true and he got that was enough for him to get his phd get a post doc and now it is actually being extensively used all over the world that's true so such things do happen you need yeah. to be patient he actually told me once sir i am not fit for research nothing works in my hand i said right. nothing nothing doing like that it is not that way you are putting your sincere effort hard work mm-hmm. you are putting there is nothing that okay it's it's all chance it is all matter of luck there is various yeah. kinds luck plays a role believe yeah. it or not luck does play a role in all yeah. of these things so there is a certain kind of you have to be patient you have to be mm-hmm. patient do your work sincerely with mm-hmm. commitment i have seen you doing work sincerely and commit with commitment i told him mm-hmm. so it happens like that okay fine we have also experienced this all through my life i have experienced this so this happens but be courageous yeah. and you see now he is so happy and yeah. that actually changed his career yeah everything got that is uh, and similar thing happened i think even pushpa's case also was also similar yeah pushpa's case if uh, uh, she was, she she was interested in working with malaria p2 mm. protein mm. so i told her pushpa look 
two other students have worked on this before mm. and they have failed mm. so do you want to take that chance you also want to continue to work in that area she so said sir i want to do it because an interesting system i said very good but there is a, this risk is there yeah and uh, she said yes okay but she was so confident of mm. uh, her uh, analysis of the nmr spectra mm. then she said sir i have a problem with the sequence of this molecule Hmm. i suspect the sequence that is given to us is wrong hmm. i said okay then go ahead and sequence it hmm. she got it sequence lo and behold the sequence is indeed wrong hmm. and that is why the two people who had worked on it failed yeah and then after that there is no looking back i just going on very well she published several papers on uh, p2 protein afterwards right and they continued to do that so yeah. but it requires a courage it requires courage commitment and patience Yeah. patience for all of these things and this happens so a similar similar thing had happened with anup madan anup madan also example i quote many mm. times said so mm. he actually came to me for doing phd mm. uh, he said sir i want to work with you for phd but i do not want to do nmr are bhai to if you don't want to do nmr there is nothing else i can teach you i can only teach you nmr and he said i want to do biology you want to do biology that was the time we were actually trying to establish the protein chemistry lab we didn't have the protein chemistry lab at that time right so we were having only computational nmr labs protein chemistry he said i am ready to establish a protein chemistry lab but i said i cannot help you no problem i will then i talked to one of my molecular biology friend lc padi so now mm-hmm. here is a boy who is so committed to doing research in biology he wants to work in this i need your help so he said okay no problem let us collaborate so we started collaborating and, he, and then i told ano i will give you two years time i will give you two years time to set up this and start get going with that hmm. if you don't succeed in that after all this you will have to do what i will ask you to do hmm. he said okay taken accepted challenge accepted yeah. you get the courage you get the courage challenge accepted i yeah. said okay fine and then he worked day and night day and, and my god unbelievable the kind of energy he had mm. and ordering equipments nothing was there everything had to be ordered equipments mm. had to be ordered purchase department you have to chase money has to be given release money was not an issue but the procedures mm. this yeah. and he so two years ho gaya abhi protein nahi aaya <laughs> no <laughs> protein has not come yeah so yeah. then he said Amazing. Another six months. Another six right. months. Right. Right. Said okay, I'll do another six months. Yeah. And then you see, in six months the protein came. Yeah. Protein came, and then there was no stopping on that. The entire protein chemistry lab in TFR is because of that. Hmm. It started hmm. developing from there. How yeah. today? How many people do protein chemistry in TFR? Everybody do, uses this lab only. Yeah, yeah. It is all shared. Yes. Are, yes. All of them are used, and he is the source. right that is the courage that is the courage commitment and dedication difficulties do arise yeah but these are the success stories which one has to remember to get motivated and inspired okay yeah. with that kind of a motivation dedication you will achieve you will yes. achieve yeah and yeah. this is this is what is required yeah thanks for your words professor hosur yes uh, we we need patience we we have to be motivated inspired what we are doing yeah. actually and i think with this line uh, we can do better so now i would like to invite my other pillars um, to raise question if they have yeah uh, maybe uh, maybe i'll pitch in uh, thank yes. you so much professor for your pulse of wisdom we really enjoyed it was okay. wonderful thank so you. in the interest of time Yeah. Uh, I'll just ask you a quick question. So, since you raised this issue of policy makers and uh, how they use blanket uh, policies, uh, uh, yeah. um, so being young researchers, how do you think we can contribute to this policy making process? Yes, that is a good question. That is a good question, and um, there are there are certain agencies hmm, who actually look into this kind of problems. DST has something. and recently one of our former students of cbs monish burana he he actually took up to this kind of a thing and he, he is interfacing with the government departments dst and dbt to bring out these issues to them and in the special cases when they are made actually they will they will look at them favorably 
the government is also coming out with new ideas with new ideas to support uh, difficult situations like this as a general rule the policies are made in a particular way but there always there has to be place for exceptions no rule has to be a black and white rule rules are there as guidelines typically but depending upon the case one has to be able to make exceptions and this has been accepted people are accepting this sort of a situation but you need to make a case need to make a case and the exceptions can be made so that is how uh, in the tfr also you see after the phd uh, initially the post docs will not be appointed unless the degree is given but no now that is not the case in tfr so yeah. this is soon after to submit your phd thesis you become a visiting fellow you start getting some salary over there so some sort of adjustments can be made and they are making it the um, uh, the government is also doing it the dae has also uh, uh, regularly in extending the periods they are providing more manpower with the support increasing the salaries all of these things they are doing so awareness is there now this has to be pursued with a little bit of uh, commitment uh, case by case it is going right now and of course they inspire fellowship inspire faculty fellowship why it has come it has come because of these things only appointments see the faculty positions were not enough therefore and but at the same time you are getting generating a lot of faculty and we are losing them and they are not able to come back to india they are going to various places and therefore they should, if you want to attract them some of policies had to be created and that is how these policies of inspire faculty has come up ramanujam has come up ravalinga swami has come up so these kind of uh, ideas are emerging and people are given these fellowships to come back in india establish in a particular place for some time and you have time to look for positions elsewhere in the process so the i think the policy makers are also aware of these ones and they are trying to do best their best in uh, with what they have harish yeah. uh, thank you manchu uh, thank you professor for sharing such inspiring stories with us i do have a, like i want to have a suggestion from your side for people like us so we yeah. are working here uh, abroad like say for several years like uh, some people are for 5 10 20 years almost Uh -huh. uh, so do you see is there a way that we can contribute directly to indian education system like is there exist a mechanism where uh, not re to return to india but still uh -huh. while we are here in whatever uh -huh. capacity we are is there, there exist a mechanism where we can we can contribute yeah okay how we can contribute being there yeah, yes okay now uh, see the one way to contribute will be to participate in academic discussions okay so the the discussions with the students at the student level you can interact with them okay at the faculty level also you can enter with participating in conferences anyway everybody will do okay mm -hmm. so but interaction at the personal level with the students will always help that is uh, because they may not have access to all the various kinds of facilities in a particular place now they may be handicapped by that so now if you have access to those kinds of facilities elsewhere then the one should try and interact with the students uh, you, can, you can go through the faculty all right but the, st uh, the students will be the ones who are directly interacting with you and that way you can contribute to their research using the facilities matter you may end up in a in the collaboration which is okay that is uh, collaboration is always welcome you can do with a collaboration and sometimes you can only provide academic advice interpretational advice this kind mm -hmm. of things can be done so that you can do remotely from being uh, outside thank you thank you shiv please yeah. go ahead okay thank you very much sir for enlightening us with your very much visionary thinking so okay. uh, my question is in the direction like you established cbs which i see yeah. like is an internal control within a university that can derive other departments towards the excellence yeah. so yeah. similarly we have lot of ayurveda hospitals uh, and several universities even but the yeah. links that can or the platform that can really connect them to the basic scientific practices where one can do the molecular biology protein chemistry yeah. for ayurvedic yeah. products uh, do you have any vision in that direction so some centers like so, as i said yeah i mentioned that no you have to involve the ayurvedic doctors Mm -hmm. you are involved the ayurvedic doctors in your proposals okay. there is an ayush department of the government of india you know mm -hmm. that there is a ministry called ayush which mm -hmm. is meant for ayurvedic research only mm -hmm. so you can have a link with the ayush 
with that and involve the ayurvedic doctors in your research proposals okay your research proposal may be purely scientific modern science science based but the problems are derived from the ayurveda you derive the pro pro problems from the ayurveda and look at it from the modern science perspective okay then you can write a grant proposal to the ayush ministry or some other ministry which will provide you funds for developing this therefore that networking is necessary the networking between the modern scientists and the ayurvedic practitioners if you do that they will also feel bolstered okay mm -hmm. they will feel quite encouraged to take forward their own uh, system okay and, mm -hmm. and yoga is another example for instance ayurveda is yoga is a part of ayurveda in a way mm -hmm. okay yoga is an important element now today you see all american hospitals medical hospitals they have yoga as an indi indi an, in, an essential component Yeah. How did that come up? That yoga was there in India for centuries, thousands of years, and today it has come up and already picked up by. However, they are only picked up only as a exercise point of view, physical exercise. But yoga has much more than that. Okay, so now you exploit all of that and demonstrate it, and this is recognized by the Indian government, the Ayush Ministry, and they have actually sanctioned an institution for yoga, okay. institution for yoga in Bangalore. or at the cost of some 100 crores or something like that mm -hmm. so yoga is then another important area which deals with your health care which deals with the system because it deals with your uh, um, uh, metabolism inside it control peace of mind you see the so called placebo effect so if mm -hmm. you have uh, the mind is under control you don't get excited so when you don't get excited your biological system also responds to it okay when you get angry your biological system behaves differently but if you are peaceful then your biology is also peaceful <laughs> so <laughs> therefore that is how the yoga comes into the picture so yoga yeah. yoga actually uh, promotes this peaceful attitude okay yeah. how to control yourself how to control your mind when you control your mind you always think peacefully when you think peacefully you think rationally and when that happens you actually come with wisdom Mm. Okay, in an agitated mind, you cannot come with wisdom. Agitated mind thinks always in a particular way that does not bring happiness. Mm. Okay, that does not promote yoga. Mm. Okay, in an agitated mind, you cannot come with wisdom. Agitated mind thinks always in a particular way that does not bring happiness. Mm. Okay, that does not promote quality ideas. So, therefore, mm. a peaceful mind is very essential for creative research, and this is the principle of yoga. yeah no sir you, you you are absolutely right even in germany also i heard in some university they are doing yoga epigenetics yes And yes that was really wonderful absolutely yeah. but you see all of these things are there in our uh, ancestral wisdom yeah that, so but you combine that with the modern developments you reach much greater heights exactly you not that what you are doing currently has to be thrown out no you have to take this these are the great developments that have happened but use the ayurvedic the ancestral i mean your ancient wisdom combine it with that then you go to much greater heights yeah that is what one needs to do yeah thank you so much okay. great great professor hosur thanks for inspiring very interesting uh, discussion and uh, motivating us uh, thanks a lot sir and uh, i i am looking forward to meet you in person okay all so the best to you all of you thanks yeah. a lot sir thank thanks you. a lot nice